Okay, it's live. <laughs> all right. Happy afternoon. Happy Sunday, everybody. I hope you all are doing well. Uh, we're doing this Facebook Live or a uh, YouTube Live thing here. I'm going to try it out. So hopefully it's clear where you all can see it. Uh, if you guys hop on here and want to share this, share the video. Get I want this story to get out there. I think it's going to help a lot of people. Uh, this is Hannah Prosser, and she, she wants to share her story on uh, – how she uh, grew up. You guys grew up in uh, kind of outside the uh, Mennonite, but then later on joined the Mennonites. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. So as growing up as a kid, um, you guys were like sheltered and, and not, were told that you had to follow your uh, father and what his rules were, correct? Right. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. We, uh, we were very isolated when I was young. We were homeschooled. We weren't allowed to even have friends. Not even my mom was allowed to have friends. Um, when I was young, I had four other siblings, so there was five of us in total. And um, we weren't, you know, with the whole friends thing, mom would actually take us to the library sometimes just so we could see other kids, even though we couldn't be friends with them, we weren't supposed to talk to them. We were just allowed to be in the presence in a side of building with other kids while wow, in the library. Um, and my dad was actually a doctor and he had his own practice. We lived in Tompkinsville, Kentucky. And um, sorry, this was really weird. Okay. Did you pause it? Oh, no, no I'm just going to, I was going to see if I can comment on some of the, uh, see, hello, Darren. Oh, but yeah, go ahead. You're good. <laughs> You're good to go. Sorry, everybody. That's kind of awkward. So, um, But your father was a doctor. Yes. And what, what was would he help like people in the hospitals? Would he, he had a job at a hospital? Is that is that correct, or was he just doing business out of his own home? Well, he worked in ERs, and then he had an actual office. And then, in order to kind of get more control and you know, I guess keep an eye on us more, he decided to build an office in our basement. Okay. So he did that. Um, he sold the office there in Tompkinsville and was just working out of the house. And um, he was just awful. I mean, honestly, he, he was horrible. Um, my mom, she would have fights with him and fight for us kids to have the rights to have friends, to go to a public school, to be able to socialize with other people. But in the end, you know, he always won. So... Yeah, what really stands out to me, uh, Hannah, is uh, when I was reading your book, uh, by the way, before I even wait any longer, anybody wants to read her story, she's also got a book, uh, Beat, that's the title of the book, just Beat? It's Beat. The subtitle is My Journey Through Abuse and the Hold'em and Mennonite. This is what it looks like. Uh, her whole story is in there, but I'll be honest with you, when, when I was reading your story there with... Um, just the rules that your dad had, you know, a lot of the, the Amish and Mennonites, a lot of the people I've had on had testimonies, uh, is the power and control. That was That's what was really standing out to me as I was reading her book. Um, he put rules in place to where your mother even had to follow it. And then, right. and then I'm reading how uh, if your mother didn't follow it, not only were you guys getting beat, she, he would even beat her into submission. Is that yes, correct? That is correct, yeah. Wow. So he really wanted you guys to follow that. And is that maybe why he was attracted to the Mennonites? Because they had those same values with power and control over women? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, he definitely believed and made it very clear, you know, females, um, whether you were a grown woman or much less a, a young girl, you were nothing. Um, you couldn't have an opinion. There was no way you could possibly have thoughts of your own. Um, you couldn't be creative even because there's no way you could possibly just think of something interesting or creative or smart without having learned it somewhere. So if I had a creative idea, I was a very creative kid, um, then he would beat me to force me to tell him where I learned that because if he didn't know where I learned it, then that meant that I must have got some kind of like outside information <laughs> type thing. You know, but I was I was just naturally curious and creative and I don't know, came up with a lot of things. But mm -hmm. we um, I had some plastic horses 
and I wasn't even allowed to play with them, um, like have them talk back and forth together. I could have them neigh back and forth or whinny, but they couldn't, you know, talk. Like, you know how kids play, they talk, you know, make, yeah. have their little conversations with their toys, but I couldn't do that because that wasn't natural. So I'd be beat for that when I'd be caught. Yeah, I, I read that about an hour before you got here. Yeah. <laughs> and that really troubled me because we all have imaginations as a kid. And your father would tell you that that is not what a Christian girl should do and would punish you for literally pretending like it's something you're talking to it. Yeah. You yeah, can get absolutely. beaten for that. Yes. Wow. It was just, it was crazy. <laughs> but, and I, I hated him so much. Um, I knew, I mean, even though we weren't really in the outside world, I knew from conversations and fights that I'd overhear um, between him and my mom and other people, I knew that there was another way, a better way, a way that other kids were growing up that was, you know, they got to have friends and, you know, have like, well, a better education too, because, which it really didn't matter so much when I was that small. Um, but you know, of course, my mom was teaching us. She had a lot of kids and she was very stressed. She was depressed. Um, and of course, I didn't know it or understand it at the time, but she was suicidal as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So, so she got to where she really didn't even want to live because she knew it was wrong what was happening. Uh, I, I wrote one question down because of what I, I went through in my, my home in the Amish. As sometimes our mom did pack up and go for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, but sometimes she just put up with it. She just tolerated it. She was hoping it would get better. Right. So that's one question I was going to ask you is why didn't your mom just take the kids and take off? Can you kind of explain maybe she didn't fear? Is that what was holding her back? Or? I think it was more, well, you know, she kept hoping that things would get better. Yeah. But also she used to tell me that she was afraid because there was so many of us. And I know it's a small amount. You know, at the time it was five. There wound up being six of us in total um, later on. But, you know, that's that's a lot of mouths to feed. And she was scared. And she had always had in her mind this perfect little life. She had actually been raised by a wealthy family. And she had planned all this time, you know, she was going to marry a doctor, which she did. And she anticipated just this life of luxury and ease. And she wanted precisely six kids, three boys, three girls, which she went up with four boys, two girls, but you know, she right. did get her six. <laughs> she, did, she did get what she wanted. Yeah. 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 But this perfect little life was just what she wanted and she dreamed of and it wasn't happening, but for some crazy reason, she just kept hanging on to it was going to change. It was going to get better. And it wasn't. It was going to get a lot worse. So, and um, at the, when I, when I was, you know, younger, my older brother was the it kid. And uh, my dad would beat up on him the most and everything. And um, he took that, my brother took that out on the rest of us siblings and was just horrible, horrible too. Um, and my dad, oh, and one more thing I do want to point out, I'm for, as far as any names I mentioned, other than, you know, the basic mom, dad, brother, sister type thing, um, in my book, I have changed all names and it's not for, um, abusers protect protection. It's actually for my protection and to also protect just a couple people that, you know, are a little bit more innocent in this and got, you know, just yeah. dragged along in it. So any actual names that I say, they are not the correct names, but locations are correct. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Okay. I just thought I should throw I do. Out. By the way, I do like how you, uh, in the book, you used Ahaz for, for your for your dad. Uh-huh. You know why I like that? Because in the second book of Kings in the Bible, Ahaz is portrayed as a very evil king. Yes. That's <laughs> actually the reason I chose it, because it was an insult that I knew that he would understand. It's a direct insult to him. Because he certainly was an evil man. Yes. So. Yes. Um, also, uh, it kind of can I can I say like something that's questionable on here? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I refer to him as asshat, and ahaz kind of sounds like asshat, kind of close to us. So it's like a double <laughs> whammy. It's great. Ahaz, asshat, yeah, kind of <laughs> similar. Yeah, <kinda. laughs> 
Hey, you know what? Uh, he shouldn't even be like, like when I, there was a couple different situations where I interviewed where they were using the Amish name and religion to do much evil. I don't think anybody should be used under that name for religious groups because it makes them look bad. Uh, so I, I kind of like that you'd use that and, and change the name, yeah. you know, and it's also what you should do to protect yourself. So, yeah. But yeah, as far as far as Ahaz, I mean, I'll be honest with you, the beatings you talked about, I got beat and my brothers did too. All of us did. But some of the things you described that I was reading was really, <laughs> it, it was angering to me and it was very uh, painful just, just to read what you went through. Is there any, was there any, any time that you thought, well, if I just go call the cops, I can get him locked up. That even crossed your mind? No, no. I mean, once I got older, I definitely wished that that was something that I could do. But, you know, who's, who's going to believe a little girl when you have a doctor who was later, you know, an upstanding member of the Mennonite community? Yeah. yeah no. <laughs> so, you guys were all against your dad when he wanted to join the Mennonite community. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. We wanted more freedom and mom kept trying to fight for that more freedom. Instead, he was trying to take more away. And at first he looked at different Amish groups and he went to a couple different Amish churches, um, even took all of us to a few services. And my mom, you know, of course, was completely against it. She didn't want nothing to do with all that. And he wound up finding the Holdeman Mennonites. They're also called the Church of God in Christ Mennonites. And they are all over the U.S., Mexico, Canada. Now, the particular group he found was located in Muddy Pond, Tennessee. Um, it's close to like Cookville, Crossville, kind of in between those, if you don't know where that is. Um, <laughs> but Anyways, and we were, of course, in Tompkinsville, Kentucky, but he would drive back and forth to these services. And the Holdeman Mennonites, um, they weren't as strict as the Amish, but they were obviously not even remotely close to worldly people, which is, I know, the Amish refer to people as English, but the Mennonite term is worldly okay. for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, you know, they could they could have vehicle. <laughs> Sorry. Vehicles. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. It's okay. So they could have vehicles, but they couldn't have certain colors like bright red, lime green. Um, they couldn't have an SUV because it stood for sports utility vehicle. And they <laughs> didn't believe in sports. I mean, there was just strange reasons why they couldn't have particular vehicles. Um, and they could have phones. They could not have uh, any musical instruments of any kind, absolutely no radio, no TV. Um, the women and girls had to wear handmade clothing. And once you became a member, you had to wear your prayer bonnet and um, things like that. But the guys could wear store-bought clothes, you know, and they wow. now granted they couldn't have logos or words on them, like even a polo shirt. They couldn't wear those because they had the little polo emblem on all the shirts. Yeah. But so it was more strict, but um, yeah, the Mennonites didn't like it too much when I asked why, if it, why, if it was so bad for the women to wear store bought clothes, why could the guys like, I don't know. Anyhow, but so he, uh, they found this place and everything. And there came a day when I was nine years old, it was in 1998. And um, it was a really scary day. <laughs> um, and a lot of details are in my book, a lot more details than what I'm going to, you know, be talking about on here. But um, it was just really scary. Uh, it's okay. I can, I can do this. Okay. So sorry, I'm delaying. Um, You're okay. Take your time <laughs> if you need to take your time. I actually just read earlier it, it, uh, about the 1998 when you were nine. So I, I know I didn't get all the way through it, but I know uh, your brother pretty much died. He had to be brought back to life by CPR or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, it, yeah. I mean, if you're able to do it, share it. I mean, that was a scary moment for you because you thought you lost your brother. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Um, so I was little. I was playing in my room and um, with my horses and everything and I heard screaming fighting coming from the living room 
and I waited a little bit, but then I went out. Um, it was just, it was so loud. And when I went out into the hallway, my older brother was on top of a younger brother. And, um, yeah, he was, he was literally killing him. Um, and my brother was purple and blue and my mom was trying to pull him off and she wound up getting him off and, um, had to resuscitate my younger brother. So, but no ambulance was called. They didn't take him anywhere. Um, police weren't even called. Um, my older brother, he wound up getting a hold of my dad's dad and he came and picked him up and they left. And after that, my dad forced the rest of us into the van. I couldn't get my toy horses, which is a really big deal. I'm still upset about those horses. I just want to point out. Wow. You never saw those horses again? <laughs> no. Why wouldn't they go back and get your possessions? They went back and got some of the stuff later. Um, they had some neighbors mostly pack up and whatnot, but I don't remember seeing the horses. Not everything came back. That would probably comfort you a little bit. It was your... Yeah. Because you that was your comfort zone, right? The little yeah. toy horses? I was obsessed with the horses. They were briars, and I don't know. I keep thinking I need to find them again. and like, Well, not, of course, the exact same ones, but the same models. And buy them. <laughs> yeah. I probably will someday, but I haven't yet, so he, even though it's dumb. Now, he just packs up and he says, all right, this incident kind of angered your dad, obviously. And now he just takes off and off we go. Yep. Yep. We left with uh, the clothes on our backs wow. and took off and went um, towards this play little community that we'd been going to with the Hold'em and Mennonites. And we wound up staying in a hotel for a little bit and then renting a house. Um and us kids, we were put in the church school, which, you know, even though everything was crazy and super terrifying um, with everything that was going on, I, you know, that was at least we got to be in a school, even though it was really incredibly tiny. Um, I don't believe there 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 were just there wasn't very many students at all. And um, we had it was like a two room schoolhouse, but there was two kind of large closets that they would open up if there was kindergartners or something like that. But pretty much it, we had the lower grades, which was grade one through four and then the upper grades, which was five through eight. And we were, yeah. So, and uh, we were only allowed an eighth grade education and all that, which really, really sucked. I was very incredibly unhappy about that, especially the older I got. Um, it, that just was horrible. I mean, who's going to deny their kid an education? And for me, learning was incredibly important. Mm -hmm. But um, my older brother, he wound up living with my dad's parents uh, from then on. And my parents tried to get custody back of him because, of course, you know, they literally abandoned him in another state. Technically, they'd left, literally moved out of town and left their son in another state. And then, you know, they were trying to get him for abuse, which was tossed out because, yeah, it just sucks. So anyways, um, I don't know what to talk about next. <laughs> well, in your school, one thing that stands out, you weren't allowed yeah. to have friends where you came from. Now mm -hmm. you're in school. Yes. So now you're probably mm -hmm. excited. Wow, I got other kids I can play with and so that was exciting, obviously, for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was. Um, we were literally released. He told us that these kids are okay to, you know, be friends with because they weren't the evil public schoolers, you know, because public school kids are just so evil. Um, <laughs> but uh, that, that was sarcastic. They were of the world, right? Right? <laughs> but. Now, one thing that I just remember reading this a little bit again in your book there. So you go to this Mennonite mm -hmm. um church and, and your family's going there and you you were talking to this little girl and she breaks away when she saw her daddy she goes and hugs her dad you really noticed that yeah why because you never experienced that right right that was a really confusing moment for me um even though you know i know i mentioned i knew things were different in other families and whatnot 
to see a girl run up to her dad and give him a hug, I was incredibly confused because relationships like that, I really, really hadn't been around. And it was just mind blowing to me. Who's like, you're willingly giving him a hug. If I, whenever I had to hug my dad, it was because he beat me until he forced me to hug him and beat me until he forced me to say, I love you. And thank you, father. And things like that. Um, yeah, no, there was definitely no willing hugging happening at any time, but she was just a happy little girl running to go hug her dad. And it just it blew my mind. You saw love there that you didn't receive from your dad. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Which her dad, I kind of wound up um, taking on as uh, I pretended he was my real dad type deal. Yeah. I'd like call him dad sometimes and whatnot. And even though I wasn't supposed to, cause that's bad and you know dishonoring. Yeah. But yeah. So on some of the, uh, when you were talking to your little toy horses mm -hmm. and your dad would spank you for literally just talking to them and, and you're acting like it's a human or whatever, talking to them like they're talking back. Mm -hmm. So he would beat you and he would say that is worldly or what? Or how, what was the reason why you got beat for that? It was unnatural, unnatural because horses do not naturally talk in, you know, voices to each other. You know, I couldn't have one horse say hi or how are you to another or anything like that. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that stood out to me. I was like, why would I mean, I heard some brutal testimonies, but I thought, why would he look at that as like a sinful thing yeah. and beat you for that? Yeah. Everything was supposed to be natural. And women were nothing. Now, I, I wrote down your dad's famous quote. I noticed you mentioned that a few times in your book. Normal people obey their authorities without question. Mm -hmm. Yep. You're not supposed to question. When he tells you to do something, you just do it, right? Oh, yeah. And if, if, it seems like you question him more than anybody else. I they, did. <laughs> yeah, that my other siblings, they they didn't like everything, of course, but they really, really didn't stand up to him. And if they did, it was very rare. Yeah. So um, I became the it kid once my older brother was gone and, you know, I was asking a lot of questions and pointing out inconsistencies and things and how things just don't make logical sense. Mm -hmm. And he, yeah, he does that's, not like being that's questioned. Why, no, 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 no. That's why I was considered so bad. Um, mm -hmm. I was called not normal about, Pretty much more than my own name. So I was, yeah, the things I did were not normal. Asking yeah. questions and things. Another thing that really uh, aggravated me almost, like, I felt anger when I read about you had to prove to him. Well, okay, so your sister was always looked at as a better than you. Yes. you. You didn't really measure up to her. Right. So she has a, as a so-called born again experience or whatever, Christian experience. Mm -hmm. And she was accepted and praised for that. So you thought, well, if I do the same thing, well, maybe you'll be accepted by your father, right? Yeah, I did that. Um, and the situation, just, uh, sorry, I'm nervous. So it's okay. I'm getting tongue tied. Um, the situation he's talking about that happened um, pre turning Holdem a Mennonite. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, my dad's dad had a tiny church in Tompkinsville, Kentucky. And, um, we would go there. There was only a handful of people that went like my little family was the huge majority of the entire congregation or church, whatever you want to call it. So and the other people that were there were older. Mm -hmm. um, but anyhow, so my sister had the saved experience and she was getting a lot of positive attention for it. And I thought, well, maybe if I do that, maybe, you know, he's not going to, whip me anymore because of course I wasn't calling it being beat you know um or be disciplined so much anymore and I can just you know have my little experience and join this local church and I'll be looked better upon and in order to prove that I was saved <laughs> this crazy man um he wanted to put me through a few tests in order to prove it because we're going back to the whole, you know, un unquestioning obedience type thing and what normal little Christian girls will do. And I hated tomatoes. Tomatoes were a thing I absolutely hated. And it was 
not just because I didn't love the flavor, but also because he loved tomatoes and was eating them and talking about them so much. So I didn't want to like something that he liked so much as well. But he made me eat a tomato. To prove that you were to a Christian. Prove, yes, yes. This was literally to prove that I was a Christian. Um, wow. Yeah. And if I did not eat it, then I wasn't a Christian because I was disobeying him. And normal little Christian girls don't disobey. Wow. So I ate the tomato. Um, then it gets much stranger because he wound up beating me in order to also prove it. Because normal little Christian girls, you know, they're... They're going to thank their parent for disciplining them. And um, they're going to tell them I love you. And they're going to not move away or flinch or cry out because they're so thankful that they're being disciplined that they're just going to stay stock still and just be so thankful while they're being hit. So <laughs> it was yeah, it's insane. But um, I did manage to get through it. And without, you know crying out or moving and did the whole thanking him after type thing. And that was enough to finally prove it. But then, I mean, he left, he left bloody welts on me and I was hurting so bad. And when I was laying in bed, I was just thinking, you know, if, if this is what being a Christian is like, then I don't think I want to be a Christian. Yeah. Cause he would, he would use religion and Christianity to be evil. Yeah. So I could see why you're just like, well, if that's what it is to be a Christian, if that's the consequences to be proved that I'm a Christian, well, then why be one, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it seemed like Christians were horrible people for the most part. Wow. Yeah, well, he certainly wasn't a good example of a Christian. Yeah. Um, You know, another thing that there, there's one verse that came to my mind that I've read in Ephesians 5.25 about uh, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. When I'm reading your book, I didn't see nothing about him, your dad, loving your mom in that way. Love. You know, it was about power and control and beat you until you submit. And, and another thing I just can't came to mind, you didn't want to lie because you're told it's, it's a sin to lie, right? Right, yeah. But yet he beat you until you literally lied. Yes, yes, he would do that. When he decided that um, something must be a certain way, then if I didn't say what he wanted me to say, then I must be lying, even if I was telling the truth. So, yeah. It so was, he made it was you do mm -hmm. what he told you not to do. Yeah. Now he's forcing you to do it, and he'd whip you until you submit and say, okay, all right, yeah. just go with the flow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. i tell you, that was uh, – that, that's that was you have a touching story. I mean, it just kind of stood out to me, especially with – I mean, there's there's even people ask, can you join the Amish? Can you join the Mennonites if you're never Amish? Well, your family did literally that. Yeah. And, and the reason your dad wanted to do that is because it fit what he liked to do. That is power and control, make women submit to the man. Mm -hmm. and, and so he wanted, wanted to go there for that reason is what it was. Yeah. He wanted full submission from all of us. Um, you know, we were, we were property to him, mom and the kids. That's pretty much what we were. We were the pawns in his game um he would tell us you know even our things didn't belong to us whether it be our clothes our shoes um toys they weren't ours they were his everything was his wow yeah did you since the girls and your mom got such severe abuse did you ever want to be a boy because of that did you long to be one of your brothers Sometimes, yeah. I mean, boys, they they got to do so much more, and I definitely wanted to wear pants. Another thing is I, I, and I questioned the whole dress thing because I wasn't, because I wore dresses, I wasn't allowed to, you know, turn somersaults and climb trees, which I wanted to do, and I still did, but I just got in trouble for it. Um, but if dresses are supposed to be modest, then, and I just want to run around and be a kid, then why do I get in trouble for being immodest while modestly wearing this dress by turning somersaults or whatever? Yeah. Um, wouldn't it be more modest to wear pants? It just made sense to me to wear pants, and then I can do all the things the boys can do. Right. Yeah. Because you got yelled at every time your, your dress would go up too high for your dad's pleasing, but right. you're just a little girl playing. I mean, how are you going to control that every time the wind catches your dress, right? Yeah. 
So it would actually be more modest then to wear pants because mm -hmm. it would stay on. You don't have to try to keep pushing it down. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see what you mean. Yeah. yeah. And for anyone that's worn dresses, I know what it's, y'all know what it's like on windy days. It isn't always fun. So. I also, just by reading part of your book, I haven't been through it, but your dad, your mom very much wanted to protect her daughters. Yeah. And she would have loved to do more to make you happy. That's why she would take you away and go to the local library. Yes. Yeah. Um, she would, even after we turned Hold'em and Mennonite, she would still take us to the library. And we would sneak back books in grocery bags. Like, actually mix them in with real groceries to sneak them into the house. Because he'd be so upset about it. Um, the Hold'em and Mennonites, they definitely wanted to limit the learning by a lot. And plus, there's a lot of things that, in a library that are completely forbidden, like even romance books. Because if you um, read a romance book, then that's, it's just unlike anything that Mennonites are allowed to do. Um, there's dating, there's kissing, and Mennonites are not allowed to date. I believe Amish have some kind Same of courtship, thing. right? Yep. yep. They have court, yeah. But um, the, with the Mennonites, there's no courtship even. There's nothing that even resembles dating. Really? Yes. So you yes. went more extreme in that Mennonite community than yeah. my Amish. <laughs> well, I think your Amish is more extreme in certain ways, and the whole right. men's are more extreme in other ways. So they kind of offset each other. Yeah. How'd ways. you how'd you date and get to know a guy that in that community? Well, there was no dating. Really? <laughs> yes. So what a lot of people did once they had teenagers that were old enough to uh, be married or start looking for someone when they were 15 and up, then they would start traveling a lot or sending them with other families who were traveling to weddings and whatnot of other Holdemans. Um, and they would, you know, so you can, you can see other, your age. Sorry. Gotcha. I'm just starting to talk weird again. Meet people okay. your age finally is what you're saying. So now you're like. <laughs> yes, you can see others. Um, but you can't, you know, of course you can't hang out in private or anything like that. There's always other people around. Um, and But there's still no courting. If a guy decides that he likes a girl, then he gives the proposal to his ministers. And then his ministers uh, like pray on it for a while and then if they kind of approve it and feel like okay yeah. this girl it might be okay for you two to get married then they move it to the girls ministers and the ministers pray on it for a little while and then they deliver the proposal from the guy to the girl and the girl gets to decide yes or no and this may be someone that she has seen once maybe she's seen him from afar maybe she has no idea who this guy even is. Maybe he's across the country or he's in Canada, you know, and, or maybe he's the next congregation over and she's seen him at, at a dozen events and at least spoken to him. Yeah. But um, once the proposal is accepted, they have precisely three months to get married, which I think is silly. Three because, months. <laughs> yes. When I got out here, I found it really, really strange because some people would get engaged and be engaged for like five years. I'm like, what are you talking about? You have to get married in three months. <laughs> yeah. So. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for sh sharing. I mean, I've, I've heard a lot about Mennonites, but I'm going to tell you right now that Hold'em and Mennonite community has lost its marbles. <laughs> yes, they have. Yeah. <laughs> um, I see uh, some, some questions there on. Uh, okay. Ed says, what is your guest relationship to her father and mother today? Um, well, I wound up getting out at 17 in 2006. My mom left in 2007 and, um, she lives fairly close to me and I do talk to her, even though she had a huge hand in the abuse I went through. Um, my dad, I don't talk to him. <laughs> I, I mean, I haven't even gotten to the really bad parts yet, actually, but there's huge reasons why I don't talk to him more than I've said so far. Okay. Um, and I, I never will. I'm just yeah. waiting for the day that he dies. So, cause wow. I will be very happy. That's probably a really bad thing to say, but. Well, you know, you've been through a lot of pain and, and that's why one, one of the reasons I wanted you to share your story. You, you've had 
been through some things that you still have open wounds. Um, I didn't read all of your book yet, but I can only imagine where you're going with that um, because of the abuse. Yeah. Uh, but what really stands out to me is joining a religious group in order to continue doing the way he wanted to do it with mm -hmm. his power. Yeah. Yeah. And for it to be accepted there, that's the mm -hmm. thing because the Mennonites, they also treated women like, you know, you, you can't make decisions. The man's the head of household. And if you're an unmarried woman, even if you, you're, you know, 20 or, I don't know, 25, whatever, then your dad is still the authority. It's not like out here, you turn 18, you're a yeah. grown adult. It's, it's not like that. Yeah. Even in my Amish community, you wasn't an adult until you're 21. Yeah. I mean, that was the rule. I see Sarah Davis says arranged marriage or have a choice. So was it kind of arranged then almost, or you, you still had a, were you still able to choose who you wanted or not? The guys had the primary choice. Um, okay. As far as the females back then, and I, I have heard that they have, um, they, they're more able to say no now, but back then you really weren't able to say no to a proposal, not as a female. You pretty much had to say yes. Wow. Yes. But um, now I've even heard that some girls are able to send proposals. Um, of course, it's not as frequent, but that's what that's what I've heard. Mm -hmm. And that they can say no, which is great. <laughs> yeah. Because it's I, I just I can't imagine marrying a complete stranger. Mm -hmm. I really can't. I, I don't want to hop too far ahead. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're bouncing I, everywhere. Yeah, I, I kind of go everywhere because I like to get those key things. But yeah, I, I I really feel led to ask you about this whole being boarded, literally boarded into your room. Was this while you were in the Mennonite community? Yes. Yeah. They because obviously they didn't want you to go for help and expose what's happening. Uh, but they had you in this room and they would board you in there. Why was that? I feel like I should actually start back and then that's go fine. up to that. That's because fine. That's, okay. Go okay. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to jump too far ahead, but I also want to share. Yeah. I would like for you to go into that if you feel okay to do so. So I think that's very important because there's there's people out there in this world today, and I'm telling you, that are in these situations that uh, could get a hold of your testimony. Uh, your story could, could really help them and encourage them because there, there's just gruesome things happening out there. Yeah. So, yeah, if you want to share kind of what led up to that and, and, and what resulted in, in them locking you up like that. Okay. Hang on, I need to drink it. <laughs> just take your time. You, you, we got all day. <laughs> this is going to be a really long video. Okay. That's fine. All right. So, um, when... I'm actually going to, I'm going to start with something that, you know, is completely different, but it's also just part of the abuse and the control. Um, when I was 13, my dad began raping me and I didn't know that word at the time. Um, I didn't, I, it, I just, I knew that it was really bad. It was something that was really, really bad. Um, and Okay, no, I'm not going to scrub that after all. So, <laughs> so my book, you can read my book. Um, so, sorry, I know I'm leaving you guys with really long, weird, awkward pauses. That's okay. Okay. I always tell any victim, take the, all the time you need. There's no rush. You just take your time. Okay. So... That wound up continuing, you know, that entire time I was there. But um, I, I tried to tell some people, and, of course, I told my mom. She told me, you know, there was no way that that was happening, that I'm lying. Um, and he would, he would beat me so often. It was just, it was crazy. And it was getting to the point, as I was becoming a teenager, he would actually beat me for hours at a time. And um, there would be days where, oh, and by this time, he had built a office onto the back of our, our Mennonite home. Well, I mean, I guess it was a Mennonite home because we lived there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's just a house, okay? Mm -hmm. So he was seeing patients back there. There would be days that he would have my mom cancel 
all of his appointments, even, you know, 30 minutes before the first patient is supposed to be there. And I remember her being really upset that she has to call these people and, you know, well, patients are about to start coming. But um, he would decide that he would want to spend the day disciplining me. And I tried and tried and tried to get help. I tried to tell people and I was told that it wasn't possible for someone like for an abuser, for an adult, for a person to physically beat someone for hours at a time. No one cared that he took breaks because that's how he did it. He would beat me until, um, you know, he was he was just sweating and exhausted. And of course, I would be sweating and exhausted Um and then he would make me lay on the floor beside him. And he usually brought books in. He'd bring like the Bible or a book on child discipline, something like that. And he would lay there and he would make me hold his hand while I laid there. And he would hold his other hand up reading this book. Um, or, you know, he would go to the bathroom, get somebody kind of thing, whatever. Eventually he would come back and. He would beat me more. And the things that he was beating me for was, you know, for being curious, for asking questions, for demanding a further education, because by this point I was demanding it. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted an education no matter what. I knew I wasn't going to be staying Mennonite. I knew and not not just that, not for the going forward part, but just I for me, learning was just as important as eating. To me I had to learn mm-hmm. I, I just had to and um, but of course that wasn't gonna happen and um, uh, once I graduated the eighth grade that was it for my education um, nobody would help me with the being beat part um, or the other, I pretty much, I told my mom, but I really hadn't told a lot of other people at that point. Um, but of course, it's just nobody would help me. And over and over, I was being told that I was being disciplined and that this was right and that this was good and that this was allowed and that he was doing it, you know, to save my soul. And it turned me into a normal person because normal little girls don't ask questions and wow. normal little girls don't fight against what they're told to do. And I just, I was supposed to do every single thing he wanted, no matter what it was without question. And, um, he was trying to break me and he even told me he was going to break me like a horse. And he did. He literally kind of lunged me around in that bedroom, like, like you would a horse. Wow. So, um, yeah, he was just this horrible guy. Yeah, I'm sorry you had to go through all that. It's you're a strong woman to be able to even sit and be interviewed with anybody to share all of that. How how are you able to deal with with, with that kind of pain? Are are you going to any kind of counseling? Obviously, there's PTSD that can haunt you for the rest of your life potentially. Are you getting any kind of help at all or counseling? Um, I just started seeing a therapist actually. Good. good. Um. I'm, I've been out for quite a while. I got out in 2006. Um, man, I escaped. But um, I after I got out, I really couldn't talk about what happened, not to the extent that there was going to be able to be any justice for what had happened to me. And I clammed up. I tried to, I just completely stopped talking about it. Um, I couldn't tell people where I was from. I would lie about where I was from. Um, and, or I would just say, you know, I'm from here, wherever here was at the moment, because in a way, I'm in a way that was kind of the way to do it without kind of lying, because technically I'm here now. Right. So I can, if someone says, where are you from? From here now. So I mean, right. Yeah. So it's kind of not a lie, but I knew what they meant. So it's still a lie. Um, but being asked where I'm from, oh yeah, and I was asked where I was from last night. It sucked. I, I, I got all weird and walked away. And so now, the neighbor's friends probably think I'm crazy, which is totally okay. Yeah. So maybe I won't see them again. Maybe you won't see them again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, um, 
in 2020, I wound up having this really big breakdown. It was triggered by my sister's breakdown. Of course, all those years, my siblings watched my abuse, but they were told the same things I was, Mm -hmm. that I was being, you know, disciplined and that he had every right, yada, yada. And I was bad. I was not normal because I wasn't submitting like the other kids were. And, um, so she, she, my sister just started talk, bringing all this up and talking about it and apologizing and saying she was so sorry that she had not been able to do anything and she hadn't recognized it. And she hadn't known that I needed help because of all the abuse. My siblings didn't even know that I needed help, even though eventually I was even kept dead bolted into my bedroom. Which I'm getting to. I know Eli is like impatient for this. He's like, hey, take your time know, I because <laughs> I think all those little details are very important yeah. leading up to why he would do such a gruesome thing to you. Yeah. But um, when I had when I had my big breakdown, I um, of course he mentioned you know PTSD. I have severe PTSD, and it affects every single day, every single night. It sucks. Um, but. I was at the point where I felt I could not take it anymore. I could not. And I was going to end everything. But I didn't want to go out without first telling my story. And I actually um, went to see a counselor and was going to try to tell her my story. But I felt like she wasn't listening. And it was really hard for me to talk about it. And so... I didn't really want to tell her anything. <laughs> it did not work out. I didn't go back. I was like, okay, I have to write my story. So I wasn't intending to be a full book, but it turned into it. I was just going to, I guess, write some chapters, write out, you know, my overall story of what happened to me and what led to this point and why I had to die. But um, as I was writing it, I realized that the only way for people to understand what happened to me was to put the feeling and the emotion and the the fear and the pain and how everything triggered the next thing Mm -hmm. into my book so that people could know just how bad it was and I couldn't take it anymore. And, and, um, I, I managed to, you know, keep going and finish it. And then in, um, the beginning of June this year, I published it. So, and I'm, I'm better now. (laughs) So there's that, like, I'm not, yeah, but I was, the original plan was that to write my story and then just leave it behind. And then you were just going to get it over with. Yeah. I just, I couldn't take it anymore. I mean, the PTSD is just, it's been horrible. It's been really horrible. Yeah. So, um, Anyhow, so kind of back to the whole story thing. Oh, yeah, and by the way, I smile when I'm really awkward or nervous. So just because I'm smiling, it doesn't mean, like, it's something positive. <laughs> I do that. I also smile when I'm mad. It's really weird. It's a very awkward response. Well, you just do whatever your emotions cause you to do. Right? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, come, you know, when I was... 15, of course, I was just, I was being so severely abused and I was able to join the youth group and my dad let me go with um, a couple other families and whatnot to a few weddings and such other congregations and then kind of all that wound up stopping. Um, Everything kind of came to a halt. He wound up starting to keep me dead bolted in my bedroom with the windows now shut because he knew I, well, for one, I wanted to get out of there. <laughs> Didn't want to be there. Um, and I tried to run away once before when I was 13 too. So we kind of used that as, as though I was a runaway risk or whatever. Um, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You say something. Well, I uh, I know by reading your book that you you went through some immense uh, serious abuse and I don't think a lot of people would even be here. To be honest with you, 
uh, with what you went through and still be able to share your story and, and write a book. Uh, here's her book. If anybody wants to buy her book, uh, Beat. Uh, can, can they find that on Amazon? Or you put it in yeah. the title there too. So. Yeah, I, I put it the title in the description. Yeah, in the description the box YouTube. there. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you can read, you can buy her whole story. You'll see it all in there. But you wasn't only physically abused then. You were very much sexually abused um, by brother and by, was it, was it ever your dad? Okay, that's what I got. I haven't read all of your book yet, but I just kind of want to get, you know, the picture of the whole thing where as you got older, it really didn't stop. You kept getting sexually abused. Well, I can tell you that I have had a lot of victims that I've interviewed, Facebook and YouTube, where uh, it continued, continued and continued. But there was really, because of the religious setting that you're in, there was really no exposing it. You know, the Mennonites are probably the same as my community in the Amish, where they, everything stayed hush-hush. Yeah. So it just continued, and your dad would never get busted? No. No, and when I tried to ask people for help, they just, you know, I was told things weren't possible. Or even if a few people did have questions, uh, he was pulled by the ministers a few times to have a few meetings. But by the end of it, you know, <laughs> he's the head of household. He's the man. Of course, why would he lie? The doctor. Oh, yeah, they let him stay. Stay a doctor. Oh, I said that already. I think. So he got they to stay him, a doctor. They let him because he had the education prior to knowing better. I don't think it specifically said that. Yeah. But yeah, they let him stay a doctor, even though the rest of us could only have the eighth grade education. Yeah. So I don't know. I guess I got a lot of questions, if you don't mind, because okay. like there's, I mean, him being a doctor, people probably looked up to him, right? Mm -hmm. Did he take care of you guys healthy in his home, own family then? Or was he not helping you guys stay healthy and, and help you also like he did other people? I mean, medically, he didn't take care of us. You know, when we were sick, mom took care of us. Um, he, you know, would stay far away. But he would tell people that he took care of us from the way he talked. Oh, he nurses back to health from everything. He didn't. It was my mom. <laughs> He, he very much wanted to look good to outside yes. people. Yes, yeah. and I hated it when patients or Mennonites or whoever would, you know, try to talk to me about how privileged I was or how proud I must be of my dad. And he's this magnificent doctor. No, no. But of course, yeah. I had to play along with it. Right. Because, you know, I can't say, no, he's this horrible monster. Because <laughs> you knew if you exposed him, you're going to get him more beatings. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, I tell you what, religion really does kill. I'll be honest with you. It's just some of the testimonies, people just talking to people, where, how they can just continue and continue. Uh, now, did your brothers get abused, beaten, or sexually abused as well or no? Um, Not the younger ones. Of course, my older brother, he had been abused um, by my dad, but the younger ones, it wasn't. Um, you know, I mean, they occasionally got I guess they occasionally got beat because they would get, um, you know, whippings every now and then. But they weren't anything like lasting for hours or, you know, they would get whipped or beat or whatever. And then that was it. You know, it was done. Um, so I was I was the it kid. They they didn't ask as many questions. They rolled along with things. They looked mm -hmm. down on me. Um my siblings did because I was the black sheep. I was the bad one. I was the one that was acting not normal. So. Yeah. Uh, lots of times with the testimonies and just the things I've been learning along the way is that a lot of abusers have done what they were doing because it was also done to them. Did you ever learn of anything that your dad might have been treated this same way or no? I haven't. Um, he grew up very poor. And I know that he, according to his sister, he was very mean, even when he was young. He was very, very mean. But the, I don't know the details of what, like, what he did. Oh, you know what? Yeah. She said, um, my aunt said he used to break her toys. That was one thing. But other than that, I don't know the details okay. or the specifics of mm -hmm. anything really. But... 
I was just curious because, I mean, lots of times that's what happens. You'll do exactly the way you were treated. Mm -hmm. uh, I've talked to victims out of the Amish where, you know, they ended up doing something that was done to them and it was very evil. But it, it's kind of, of dealing with the pain. They ended up doing the same thing as what was done to them yeah. just in order to try to deal with the pain. If you don't know any other way of how to deal with it, you're going to get angry and do something that's evil yeah. yourself. Uh, but I think PTSD is is something that some some of these victims have a lifetime. Uh, but I'm glad to hear that you're going through some some counseling and talking to somebody about. And I think sharing your testimony, you know, of what you went through, really helps as well. And you're you're definitely not alone. I know you got one of the more gruesome stories I've ever heard. But you're not alone though. There's a lot of people in Amish Mennonite. I, I'm hearing from Hutterite Jehovah's Witness. There's a lot of religious settings where they, this abuse is really out of control. They just have no handle on it. Yeah. And, you know, and lots of times I hear, well, why don't they just go out and call the cops? Why don't they just go right, walk out the door? It's not that easy, is it? No, no. It's, it's the mental and emotional abuse as well. I mean, like I said, I, was, I just kept being told over and over it was allowed, and I knew it was all bad. And I knew it was all horrible, but, you know, how – how do you prove something is yeah. bad when it's supposed to all be allowed? It was yeah. very, very confusing. Um, and part of, I guess, the shame of just even the confusion. Because things should just be black and white, white right? They should be good or bad, right or wrong. But it isn't always like that. Mm -hmm. There are lines. Yeah. So. When you left... Were your family still in that same Mennonite community, or did you guys relocate again before you left? No, it was still the same. Still the Holdeman Mennonites. Mm -hmm. yeah. That sounds familiar. I, I think I've heard from some people in the Holdeman Mennonite because that's one of those names they always kept yeah. up. Like there's Beachy Mennonite, there's Holdeman uh -huh. Mennonites, you know. Yeah. Well, their church sign, sign says the Church of God in Christ Mennonite. Really? But then um, John Holdeman was the, the original creator of it, so... They also, I guess the Holdeman it might be more of the slang name, but yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, it, it's uh, it, it's really heartbreaking to to see what a lot of, and you know, I don't I don't necessarily believe you're you're alone. Uh, in, that there's victims in there right now. I know there's a ton of them in the Amish. We're only hearing the ones that escape, like yourself. Yeah. You're, you're free now. Uh, how many are not free? You know that that's what really boggles my mind is. We know of a few here and there that have come out of those groups. How many are not able and don't even have the courage, not strong enough maybe, to escape? Yeah. And, and they're just sitting there in pain and just dealing with it, dealing with it. Maybe it'll get better, and it don't, and it don't. No, it doesn't. That's what breaks my heart yeah. is just because there's so many so many that are in. Well, we're almost at an hour here. Um, I is guess the hour the limit? Huh? Is the hour the limit? No, actually oh, it ain't. Okay. But I'm actually thinking about uh, boosting up a uh, Facebook Live video as well. And uh, I don't know. You, you got a strong testimony. Now, if you feel up to it, we can do one of them too. The whole way through? You don't have to, no. Okay. Maybe the basics. Can we take a break? Yeah, we can take a break. Okay, let's take a break. We'll take a break and then and we'll, uh, we'll end the live stream. And then what we'll do is we'll boot it back up. And that way you can take a little break, regroup. And uh, she's she just getting warmed up. We could do part 10 if we had to. <laughs> but all right. Hey, uh, thanks for sharing what you've, you've shared in part one. We'll just, I'll, I'll try to re like edit this video, put like part one on it. And then if we do another one, we can do like part two or whatever. But thank you for what you've shared so far. Uh, but when we come back on again, uh, maybe go into, you know, deeper into some of the. I will. I know. Sorry. I'm like shaking over here. I've been shaking for a few minutes, but I'll, I'm just going to calm down and then I'll I'll come back and go into detail. Okay? All right. Hey, we'll see y'all here in a little bit. All right. Thanks for watching.